What emotions are driving the markets right now? Let's take a look at the greed index. You know, when we delve into the fear and greed index, it's looking like we got a lot of greedy bastards out there right now. Greed is good, right? Greed is good. It is good. Little greed is okay. Take a look at these charts. I think uh, we're, we're bordering, we're teetering, teetering on extreme greed. When we look at stocks, you know, real estate, there's some extreme greed right now. So my advice, just be careful and slow down. Go to the gym and think. That's the crux of capitalism, isn't it? Greed. Growth. Always more, never enough, never happy with stable profits. That's every company I've worked for in my career. Maybe I'm just saying if they were happy with stable profits, we wouldn't have run into all this corruption and problems. That's all. That's all I'm saying. So we need to, we need to address one issue before housing. Central banks. Central banks, in my opinion, brought us inflation. Now they bring us stagnation. Although the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank's message regarding interest rates cuts seems clear, reiterating their commitment to reducing inflation that they caused. The market is expecting between five and six interest rate cuts. <coughs> I did a talk on this, you know, between 1.25 and 150 basis points in the next 12 months, but it's going to be a volatile 12 months, ladies and gentlemen. Who knows what's going to happen? So this shows us the bubble bias of many investors. We live in a world where two generations of market participants have only seen rate cuts and massive liquidity injections. Central banks have created huge, you know, perverse incentives in markets that should have been, you know, prevented if they truly fouled their mandate. And that's key of stable prices. Central banks are placing all the focus on the price and not, you know, the quantity of money right now. Ignoring monetary, you know, aggregates is very dangerous in my opinion and catering decisions only on rates may create a larger problem. You know, a market bubble possibly and a real, you know, economy contraction. We're seeing it, you know, by ignoring monetary aggregates, central banks may cut rates with no real effect on the, you know, productive economy and solve nothing. And I've done talks on this. There may be a significant contraction in the economic activity, even if rates decline as credit availability worsens, even with declining rates, but markets keep inflating the um, financial bubble. So inflation has not declined uh, persistently. And since the consumer price index, if we look at this, and I talked about the PCE as well, is a year over year calculation from a, a very high figure, uh, the base effect accounts for up to 85% of the decline in inflation. The same base effect could adversely affect inflation in the coming months if the annual path of price, you know, you know, rises, remains. So right now, that's concerning, and we need to keep an eye on the central banks. So when we talk about homes right now, American people need more homes. You know, the country is short anywhere between, I think, roughly 1.5 million to 6.5 million homes, depending on which, you know, analyst you look at. That shortage has driven up rents and home prices and helped make housing costs a key driver of, you know, among younger Americans. It's kind of a disconnect right now. So the national median price of existing single family houses, you know, condos, co-ops, whose sales closed in November dropped to 387,000, 387,600, down from 6.3% from the peak in June 2022. That's according to data from the National Association of Realtors, the NAR. So 2023 is the first year since the housing bust when the seasonal high in June was below the all-time high a year earlier. So, you know, in other words, uh, June 23 was the first lower high since um, the housing bust. Uh, and, and, you know, and prices have dropped further since June along seasonal patterns. Uh, you know, take a look at the chart, you know, the medium sold price existing homes. So that's interesting. And mortgage rates dropped a whole bunch and new listings are now suddenly showing up in larger numbers than a year ago. But ladies and gentlemen, 
but buyers, not so much. Clearly, mortgage rates haven't dropped to the golden level yet. Folks are waiting for them to drop further, and the market remains somewhat frozen. So look at these charts. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, pending home sales, a forward-looking indicator, in my opinion, of sales of existing homes based on uh, contract signings in November were unchanged from October and both occupied the second lowest historic low after the historic low in April 2020, if you remember. That's according to the National Association of Realtors data. Uh, so this is not exactly what people figured in their wildest dreams, in my opinion. So look at this. Check this out. You know, sales change by region. Percent change year over year uh, from the beaten down levels of last year. So this is interesting when you look at it holistically, the map of the United States. Um, and, and you kind of see this and you break it down regionally, locally. So prices of new houses sold by home builders have already dropped 18% from the peak a year ago as builders aggressively target the new reality with lower prices, smaller houses, uh, you know, you know, they're kind of taking things down a notch with these spec houses, cheaper appliances, countertops, what have you, and big mortgage rate buy downs right now. If you look at these new home builders, thereby successfully competing with a homeowners selling their existing homes. So they're offering those buy downs, but they're using cheaper materials. And, uh, you know, that's one aspect, mortgage rate buy downs. You know, you're looking at smaller houses, smaller product footprints, uh, you know, you know, cheaper appliances, floors, countertops, you know, simpler roof, no deck in the back. Forget it. You don't need that. No pool. Get that 1%, 2% buy down. Uh, you know, so it, you know, it frees up, you know, the upgrades. So if we look at this against the backdrop, a wave of, you know, it, it, when we talk about the builders, Right now, and we look at the tech side of this, there's been a wave of startups promising to help alleviate the housing crisis by mass producing homes. Hey, you know, you know, they've raised billions of dollars. The residential construction market, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the big picture, is worth more than 500 billion each year. That's why these greedy bastards want to get in this and capturing a tiny slice of that offers, you know, outside, you know, outsize rewards for these people. So several of these startups have since run into major difficulty. Uh, there was um, uh, Katera, that's K-A-T-E-R-R-A, which went bankrupt in 21 after raising $2 billion. And uh, more recently, V-E-E-V, which said it in 2022 had raised $400 million. Surprise employees when it told them just before Thanksgiving that it was closing its doors. The layer sold itself to the home building giant uh, Lanier for a fraction of the unicorn validation. So there's another one, Tiny Box Startup. I think it's Boxtel, B O X A B L, which has raised hundreds of millions of dollars from crowdfunding, has also had its share of challenges and drawn serious scrutiny from the SEC. So, what is the deal with these tech startups? You know, they have all these great minds. But the problem is they don't work in real estate. They don't understand. You know, it turns out, guess what, my, my friends in Silicon Valley, um, building a home is hard. As anyone who has been involved with construction, and I'm on sites once a week, will tell you, there's always something that goes wrong. Mass production, uh, you know, it's, it, it puts all these inevitable problems under, you know, like one roof. It's very difficult. And you don't get that in a boardroom. You don't understand that. And we talk about material costs have dropped by a lot over the past year. And costs of appliances, what have you, have dropped some as well. But labor costs continue to increase. All builders talk about their material costs and some other costs going down. And, you know, lead times are way down and the, the speed of the construction is back to normal. So all these costs associated with endless delays have gone away and overall costs have come down despite higher labor costs, which is why builders can lower their prices directly or indirectly and still largely protect uh, their margins. Uh, you know, they might give up a little. However, I talk to people on the ground all, all the time and things are somewhat a little different. 
I talked to a builder the other day and he stated the largest material inputs um, into building our lumber, uh, windows, doors, concrete, drywall, and sometimes steel and all, you know, all the finishes. And, you know, he said further, uh, you know, futures for prices for uh, lumber are back to normal. Yes, but physical supply is still about plus 50% pre-COVID. Concrete is at an all-time high, he said. Copper, despite, you know, you know, you know, the futures are down. Actual product is still at peak. Windows doors still seeing price increases every few months, perhaps because of the labor component, he said. So everything from roofing to appliances to tile to wood flooring, no drop from the peak, he said. And I'm kind of seeing that across the board. And, and looking at other countries as well. And so sales of new houses have not collapsed to historic lows, unlike existing homes, but are at the, you know, you know, kind of muddling right now through levels of years before the pandemic. So homeowners who want to sell should keep an eye on the market for new houses because that's where the competition is. And the competition is getting fairly aggressive to try to sell new homes right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible in my opinion, what I've heard when I've walked into some of these developments, I'm seeing, I'm seeing good deals though, people, I'm seeing good deals, people. So we talk about the fed, my good friend, JP Morgan Chase, CEO, Jamie Dimon issued a stark warning to wall street on Wednesday. Inflation could rise further and recession is not off the table. What is Joe Biden and his administration saying folks? A lot of things out there are dangerous and inflationary, he said. He said, be prepared. He said at the 2023 New York uh, Times Deal Book Summit in New York, interest rates may go up and that might lead to a recession. Now they're going to go up. That's what he said. He's all over the board. You know, he's all over the board with his friend Jerome Powell. So governments across the globe need more money, he said, to uh, fund the green economy. And to address energy, the energy crisis, why don't we turn that energy back on that Joe Biden shut down day one in office? And that will be all inflationary. He said he's cautious about the economy. The labor market in the United States has been resilient, but inflation is hurting people. And that's right from his mouth. JP Morgan Chase does business, ladies and gentlemen, with TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, and is partially underwriting the planned IPO of the Chinese fast fashion company. Uh, I think it's called Shane, Shine. I think it's S-H-E-I-N. And that's according to a recent report from uh, uh, Reuters. You know, you know. so he said, um, he's not afraid of China when I was reading this. He said, China is the greatest existential threat to America. Jamie, that's what I'm saying. We are selling out the American people, sir. Stop letting China dump their goods in our country. By the way, we have had two consecutive quarters of negative growth 10 plus times since World War II, and it's always been a recession. So I would argue we're in a recession right now. We are, 100%. I'll debate you anywhere in the country on that, and I have the data. 10 plus times since World War II, always been a recession. So in sum, the man running the world, Larry Fink, Black Rocks, the co-founder, buying up all these single-family homes, uh, you know, for their institutional clients. Uh, he uh, is, is said to be leaving the firm, maybe soon. But he said not anytime soon. But the company is also prioritizing finding a successor for the 71-year-old. So there's a, you know, a small quarter of men who could take his place. In interviews with dozens of people close to BlackRock, Business Insider learned about each potential successor's style and trajectory and who's most likely to take Larry's spot once it's time. And his time is coming, maybe. But he's sitting on a yacht right now, loving life, uh, building that underground bunker, getting ready. Because it's going to be an interesting 2024. So I just want to, I want to, I've, what I've seen with the, you know, existing homes and especially the builders, and the incentives programs going on, uh, what they're trying to do, compete with existing homes is very interesting. I want to touch on that. And the central banks and inflation, you know, our energy sector was shut down day one in office. Joe Biden signed an executive order. 
That's the problem why we're having massive amounts of inflation because our energy is shut off. We were, uh, now we're calling all the big boys across the sea, Venezuela, China, Russia. We need some oil. We're, we should be energy independent. So we got a lot of moving parts for going on right now, and it's going to be a very interesting 24 because of the election. Uh, but like I said in my last video, it's an opportunity of a lifetime because you're seeing defaults in the multifamily segment, defaults in the office space, commercial space, the bloodbath, it's trickling to residential. You're seeing deals, longer days on market. Right house, some, some houses are getting multi-offers in select states that I'm looking at. But you're going to see really good deals in the next 24, 25 and what's going on in commercial, and it's going to trickle down to resi a little bit. So you have to ask yourself, interest rates go down a little bit, um, you get a good deal, or do you wait for interest rates possibly to go really down, maybe to five, maybe high four, and then home prices might go up. So I think you're better off finding a good professional that can negotiate with a seller and find a distressed seller, but a lot of sellers... Uh, that I'm talking to across the country, they're, they're looking to get out of some of this stuff and price drops are happening if you know where to look. So I think it's going to be a great opportunity. You just have to be creative out there. Take care.